are on camera. Today is January 16th, 2020. Uh, we're in Atlanta, Georgia, and my name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer with the Atlanta History Center. Uh, with me is Ms. Sue Verhoff, who is the Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the Atlanta History Center. And we're really honored to have with us today Mr. Josiah Benator. Josiah. 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 Okay. Josiah. And, Hispanic would be Josiah, but I'm Josiah. Josiah. Actually, my name really is Isaiah. Oh, really? Yeah, the prophet. Oh. Yeah. That's another interesting story. But, yeah, I want to hear that. Well, actually, uh, among the uh, Safari Jewish people, the uh, children are named after the grandparent. By the Ashkenazim, they don't do that because they think you take away the life of the grandparent. But by the Safari, it's an honor. You know, so I was named after my grandfather. Oh, interesting. The same way that Miss Berry was named actually after her grandmother, who was a Hebrew of Sephora. Sephora is bird. And so oh. that's where the bird comes from. So. That, that's very interesting. Yeah, it is. It's amazing. Yeah. It's <laughs> like that. And, uh, you know, it's an amazing story. You know, how Miss Berry and I got together. Yeah, I want to hear that. She's a about that, so whatever where, where, point we get into. Okay. Uh, where and when were you born? I was born actually in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, in uh, February 4th, 1922. Okay. And uh, actually, I was uh, born actually in Atlanta and uh, on the south side of town, I don't know where we lived at. And uh, uh, then uh, actually, we moved a couple of times. And I uh, went to uh, actually George Avenue School, then went to Paul School, and then I went to high school with Hope Smith. Okay. And then I went to Boys High. Yeah. And then I went to Georgia Tech. Yeah, okay. And you live in Atlanta, Georgia now, right? I, I live in Atlanta all my life. That's, yeah. You're a, you're a definite native of Atlanta, yeah, aren't you? Yeah, definite native. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Okay. Actually, uh, my father was a shoe repairman, and uh, uh, we had it was six children and three boys and three girls. And uh, uh, I sometimes I used to help my father go to the shoe store and, and deliver shoes, etc., things like that. And I remember uh, I was collecting some of the coins at that time. But my father says, hey, you take all my money away, kid. You take all the half dollars, you know, and that. So uh, I worked with him. Uh, I uh, went in grammar school. I, I skipped three grades. When I went into Hope Smith, four years school, I was there three years. So that's what I was there. And then when I graduated from uh, Hope Smith, and uh, I wanted to go to college, but I really couldn't afford it at that time. So I went to night school for one year, and then I finally went back to Georgia Tech and uh, got accepted. Yeah. And uh, uh, I worked with the program, the government program, which helped me go through Georgia Tech. Okay. And uh, my grades in, uh, at Georgia Tech were a double A, all throughout. So oh. I've got a copy upstairs on, on my uh, grade level. Where, so I was top student in my class that I was in industrial management. So I was in ROTC, and uh, when you graduated from Georgia Tech, before you went to graduate it, uh, in the summer, you went to uh, camp program for two weeks, went to camp. And, uh, and because we went to camp and we didn't, go to, we didn't go to school, we graduated in December instead of in May. And so and that was actually I graduated in December. And uh, for our OTC, I would have been uh, graduated as a second lieutenant. But since I didn't go to summer camp, I had to go to office to carry it to them. Okay. Then there was a, we were in the military ROTC, but 
they selected several students to go into the into the oh. uh, Port Knox, uh, so, and uh, so I went to Port Knox and took me three months off the Canada School. Okay. When I finished off the Canada School, then I was assigned to the Tenth Armored Division, and they were on the news at the time, so I, I joined them in their headquarters there. So that was General Patton's division, well, wasn't it? Uh, Third Army, yeah. yes, Third Army, so whatever. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I was assigned actually uh, a 27 millimeter uh, gun uh, platoon, and uh, the soldiers that were in that platoon were was not selected very highly in other words. Mm -hmm. had, but, so they had this, that was a group that I was with. And, uh, and uh, actually, uh, after that, we, uh, when we finished uh, the uh, three months, we came to 10th Army Division. And so we trained in 10th Army Division, actually, all the way through the beginning of uh, the winter time of that. I stayed in that group and all the way through. And we were actually uh, in uh, September, I think, of uh, 43. Uh, we uh, we actually were uh, 44. We actually went, I moved up into New York to go across to Europe. So that was in September 44. And uh, September 44, uh, we we went uh, uh, actually by ship. You know, came across. Uh, that was the only time I've gone on a ship cruise with <laughs> Uncle Sam. <laughs> And uh, we landed in Bournemouth in, in France, and uh, actually uh, it was the first landing of, uh, of troops in France where the port was ready. And so uh, we were able to land right on through. So we actually uh, uh, went across France, and I remember we, we were coming through some of the countries that had been relieved, and all the French people they're waving at us and they bring a cognac and apples oh, and that wow. as we walked on through. And we went through Paris, in other words, and, and it was amazing they were uh, walking through Paris. Uh, uh, three ladies walked on up. They were at the ladies of the, what do you call them? <laughs> ladies of the night. We didn't, take, we, we didn't actually uh, uh, go with them. What is, I think one of the ladies did go back with them, came back a little later, so what do they have? So, <laughs> <laughs> so we were actually in, 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 we were in Alsace Lorraine, and, uh, and that was uh, in uh, the autumn winter there. And then uh, we were in, uh, uh, in September of '44. Uh, uh, and actually, this was now in, in December. In December of '44. The, the Germans had uh, planned an attack, which was to, a surprise attack, which was to uh, actually separate the Allied forces and, and American forces and reach the ocean. And, uh, and they really, unfortunately, uh, our Allied forces uh, really made a mistake. They didn't realize that this was a major attack. This was, this was the Germans all out. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were pulled up from where we were at, and then we came through uh, Bastogne, mm -hmm. and we went to a couple of cities up ahead. Then we dropped back into Bastogne, and uh, the, we were there, and uh, the, uh, the Germans, his soldiers, uh, uh, Met with, uh, we were all, we were just out of the region in Bastogne, and 101st Airborne, it's German column, was also in Bastogne. Okay. And uh, the German officers came up with a white flag, a little city outside of Bastogne, and uh, uh, they met with General McCollum. And, uh, and, and General McCollum thought they had a white flag and that they were going to surrender. And the German says, no, no, we're not surrendering. He says, well, you to surrender. 
and Joe McCall said, it's the famous word, guts. Mm -hmm. And, that. and the, the, one of the uh, officers with the Joe McCall, the chairman says, we don't know what nut means. And he says, well, and the liaison officer says, it means go to hell. Well, the the chairman says, well, if you are and you're not surrendering, we're going to bug the hell out of you. We were in the lower part of Bastogne, and the northern part of Bastogne, 101st was there, and we were back at Lowell. And uh, so the Germans did, as they said, they had major artillery shelled at the northern part of Bastogne. We lost our liaison officer, he was up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a, I remember the story that there was a place where they had wounded uh, soldiers in his building, and most of them died from the shelling there. Mm -hmm. So we had that. So we had actually, uh, twice we, w we moved up in our unit. Uh, uh, the first one, I had, uh, uh, I guess it was mortar shells that they were fired at us at uh, our diamond in the foxhole, and the, uh, I got some shot in my head. And so I went into the, I had to take me to one of the, uh, uh, Hospitals, I had to get the uh, actual uh, shrapnel second out of my head. And, uh, and, and then I came on back to my unit, and we again moved on up again. And uh, the, uh, they uh, actually uh, were shelled again. And this time the shell hit right, right next to my foxhole. Mm. And uh, I got shell shock. And uh, I didn't realize it, but when the Germans told them it was surrender, we laid out in the foxhole, and it was the coldest winter I've ever had in, uh, in, in Belgium there. So, and, uh, so I didn't realize that I got frostbite on my feet. And, uh, so I was uh, pulled back into the hospital, and uh, then they also moved into, into England. And they came back to the service, and the, at that point, they had a reassignment for all the soldiers. Where, and uh, I uh, was with the uh, labor supervision companies. Two or three groups, and then the last one was the last one I was in for a laugh. And uh, uh, we, uh, uh, what we had was we had Polish soldiers who were guarding one of the German uh, camps, but we had the, all the uh, artillery. Uh, Materials, etc. What do you have in you have in, in, a, in a camp like that? And that's where they were at. And so I was there for about a year and a half. And the war was over. And uh, since you were, uh, you had to have a certain number of service hours to be able to come. And so finally, I got my service hours. During that time, uh, I had actually been in touch with Bertie. Uh, uh, before I went overseas, I went to visit my sister in New York, and Bertie was living. And Bertie is your current spouse. In Washington, and, in Washington D.C., and uh, we're both big family. As a matter of fact, when when Bertie was ten years old, we, we lived two blocks away from each other, oh. and uh, about this to be a quarter, and I would tutor Bertie, so. <laughs> Uh, so we and so we met Bernie that night overnight, and then I went up to New York, and uh, then then of course we went overseas and such. But the amazing part of that story is that I tell you about is that I really didn't see her until after the war, and my study guys they had a a special dinner for the veterans, and so. I asked uh, Bernie, brother, and uh, we have kinship with the family. This is another story. And uh, and she was, we had I see each other since the war was over, etc. And uh, so, and uh, her brother says, "Well, you guys got to go over there to just to go over to that for that dinner. That she was telling you going to be a visiting family because she had uncles and aunts mm -hmm. in Atlanta." Yeah. And so she came to, uh, came in, said, Mary came in from California, and uh, she was here for two days. 
and uh, they had an engagement party. And I actually had a scout meeting that night. I had to get somebody to take my scout so I could come back to the engagement <laughs> party. So it was two days in there was. And so we were engaged after two days. And I never asked her to marry me. <laughs> so uh, I always told her, I said, you know, it was, uh, I never had a question about it. There was, uh, it was a very short engagement party set up. And uh, so I always teased her. And I was at a, <laughs> it was a, Actually, amazing how we got yeah. to see each other. We hadn't seen each other since before the war. Wow. It was only two days that she that she's come in, and so we got married. And uh, I, I went to work for Scripto's pen and pencil manufacturer in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, I, we had uh, actually our first child was stillbirth. And yeah. uh, that was quite a, uh, heartbreaking. Yeah. Uh, so I guess we, uh, we felt so strongly that we had lost a child that we had a, a large family and everybody was teasing us that there was, we ended up with seven children. <laughs> and, and in addition to that, she had a couple of, uh, actually, one of the children did, the birth did survive or whatever. Yeah. And so, uh, we went from crypto that went to work for uh, Raylock, which is a division of Gigi and Forrest. Okay. And they did that. Uh, uh, they, they actually re reworked, uh, you know, have a shell, brake shoes, etc., uh, and all, all the type parts of those cars. And we reworked them. And, and I said that. And I was there for 22 years with crypto in 22 years with uh, Raylock. So you had two good careers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but so it's, uh, and uh, the uh, crypto, actually, I started, I couldn't find a job when I got out of the military. I finally found a job and got paid $50 a week. It was several years, many years, ten years before I got even something decent to sell it. Yeah. So when I went to Raylock, I got into a very good program there, and yeah. uh, was able to send my kid to school. To, and nobody had made any student loans to my kids. Yeah. They went to uh, three of them went to medical school, and we paid for it all, all there. So Boy. all that she, one of my daughters is a infectious disease doctor. But she, she barred money because she says, you know, you're so tight, why do you just watch everything you say? But well, I says, hey, you know, we put you all through medical school, you know, and, uh, and so <laughs> therefore, okay. So after that, you know, we have a bunch of amazing kids. They're remarkable. And uh, the mission by, by three boys and three girls. And one of the boys was a doctor at a, a medical college of Georgia. And her daughter, who was a professional disease doctor, also went to medical college of Georgia. And the other daughter it was in Texas, anyway, and she actually went to med school there. And in, in Texas, the medical school it has funds that you get from oil. And so therefore, their fees are not very high now, but yeah, but I still paid for her fees, even though it was yeah. much so. And uh, so, and we have a, actually, uh, my son who was in the auto accident, we kept his wife and our family. In other words, she, uh, we kept in touch with her. Uh, she got married again, we went to the wedding. Mm -hmm. uh, we treated the children as our Children, Good. grandchildren, is our Good. grandchildren, and something that has been, I know some people, was remarkable that you actually kept us so closely yeah. in touch with your family. And we do keep in touch with them, just like we do with our children. Well, you're amazing parents and grandparents. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, you yeah. are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So how many children and how many grandchildren? Well, I have 13 grandchildren and four great-grandchildren. Gosh. I'm having a hard time getting my other kids to get married. I told them. <laughs> I said, y'all, y'all living together, et cetera, et cetera, but you're not 
makes me determination what you're going to do with your life. <laughs> and they're always laughing at me. And I said, well, I said, you know, I'm not getting any younger. And I, I want to be able to see you. I didn't, I just did my grandchildren because they were, all of my family moved out. One of us in, in uh, actually in, in Maryland, one of us in Texas, one of us in Salt Lake, and one mm. of us in California. Gosh. And one is uh, actually the one who, who, when my son passed away, and there was, they, they, they're up in uh, a northern part of, of, uh, of the state. So, and we've kept in touch with the family. We, I actually have, uh, usually a, every year about springtime, I will see a little check to all my oh. grandchildren. And, yeah. uh, and, and, oh. and they've been very good. Uh, yeah, two of them who were our friends, etc. And uh, we're hoping that maybe one of them finally will, I'll cut out this friend but just a little yell and go ahead and sell down. <laughs> and so I, I, I understand that they're talking about that maybe that they might uh, possibly start making some plans. So, yeah. Well, I know they must be really proud of you. I mean, they <laughs> they know what you've done in your life, and they they must love you and be proud of you, every well, one of them. Yeah. Well, I, and Scotty, actually, I was a Boy Scout in 1934. I joined the Boy Scouts. And then you... I joined at 12, and uh, I stayed in scouting until I went into military. And when I came back from the service, I picked up a troop, and uh, we had a troop for three years, and then one year, the, the, uh, for some reason or other, the troop fell apart. But the next year, a gentleman that I know quite well called me and said, we want to start a synagogue here at Chet, that's Royal City Island, in 1950. So I've been in that troop, the South Lady, since 1950 to 2020. So I've been scouting for 70 years. Gosh. And I've had 53 boys make Eagle. And so. Boy, that's. And, uh, that means you've been a great influence on them. And, yeah, uh, it's, uh, I've got a list of uh, all the boys there and been in touch with them. And we work very closely with the boys. And our troops, the troops uh, operate differently. Some of us, the boys do, uh, they work on the requirements on their own, and then, uh, then that, uh, they question on what they did. And our troop, we actually work on each of our meetings, we work with more advancement as they move up into okay. 10 foot second class, first class, and on into Star Life and Eagle. So, wow. And so I'm still a scoutmaster, and uh, which is remarkable. I'm still alive, you know, that, that so that by I, 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 I have a whole article here, two articles, several articles, and on why normally a scout leader it shows five years, and uh, there's a song that he sings about five years. I've walked the road, it's climbed the trails, etc., and I've been. The scout leader for all these years and still working now. As a matter of fact, they had a meeting yesterday, and one of the said, Well, it must be you, you stay at home right now. Well, I'll take care of it. So I, but I gave him all the instructions what what we do for boys. So, uh, well, they've got to consider themselves so lucky to have somebody with all your experiences in life to know, be able to talk you know, to. And we're fortunate to have my leaders have been. Leaders who had boys with NSR troop who made Eagle, and they have stayed in the troop. Yeah. And we work in advancement with the boys, and this leader works with these boys, this leader works with that boys over there. Gosh. So, and just only uh, about a, a few weeks ago, a young boy who had left our troop, and he was with the joint with another troop, <coughs> and, he, and he complained, he says he was not advancing, because that troop operated differently. I won't go into all those details, but that's, I, but, uh, so, he just, in a few weeks ago, he came back and joined our troop. Gosh. So have a thing first, because we work with boys to all the way up until they go into, mm. uh, for Eagle, and, uh, so, what we have, actually, there are several articles that I've had from boys who write and tell me how much Johnny meant to them. And I have a copy of one of them. 
In other words, this boy was uh, one of the Eagle Scouts, and, uh, and he was in Vietnam. And uh, when he came back from Vietnam, he wrote me. He says, you know, Mr. B, that's what I Mr. B. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you know, what I learned in scouting saved my life in Vietnam. Gosh. <laughs> And I had another one of my boys who was an uh, uh, Eagle Scout, and three boys. As a matter of fact, two of them are already doctors, and the third one is in med school. Gee. And one of the older one, Jerry, he was in the gym one day, and one of the fellow soldiers passed out. And he rushed over, checked him, there was no pulse, heartbeat, and no breathing. He, he ran away, started CPR, and he called him to get the ATM, and he gave him two boat shots of ATM, and brought the Big man, back, wow. and uh, he received a medal from the general uh, presentation for his saving the life of really? his uh, fellow soldiers. Had, uh, wow! I found out that the soldier had some heart problems too, on top of all that. Wow. So, I mean, many years ago, uh, I was one uh, family that had four boys, and all three boys were in my, in my troop, and one boy had muscular dystrophy. And it's, uh, he started from very young. And uh, uh, he was about six, seven years old, young. And his mother says, is he'll be, he'll be a boy shot? I said, sure, he'll be a boy shot. And he did, he came, he joined that troop. And I can remember he had his leg braces and he walked up Stone Mountain. And then Jeez. actually, uh, I was, one of the camping trips, it was in Bedrose. But him to get out of bed roll was very difficult, and, and, he, and I just watched him slowly push him out of bed roll. And he still gets in, keeps in touch with me. He's very still uh, strong problems with the muscle discipline. You know, mm. where you, <clears throat> you use some of the equipment to actually contact people. And so, and have him come back. And actually, we said with the, uh, when I received the award, from the Rotary Club, the Humanitarian Award, the one two years before was one of my Eagle Scouts was actually uh, Dr. Rabbi Sugarman. Mm-hmm. And Rabbi Sugarman, when he was 52, there was another boy who was in the troop, who was right, David Geffen, who is also a rabbi. He's, he's made Leah in, in Israel, and he writes articles. I've got articles on the wall, mm-hmm. they didn't see that. We'll take a look at that. And uh, there's a, in that article they wrote, he had another person who was actually one of the judges in DeKalb County, oh. and he wrote about Mr. B, mm. and he said, he must have been there just for me to get me straightened out what I'm doing. So, and his little, last article on that article that the uh, David Geffen wrote up, he wrote for the Jerusalem Post. Yeah. Well, you've had an influence, positive influence on a lot of people. Oh, yeah, I will say. Let me ask you, I, I want to back up a little bit. Yeah. And before we finish, I'm going to read what some of your yeah. people have said about you yeah. and get that on yeah. here because uh, uh, not many people have had this kind of thing said about them. Yeah. Uh, back when you were, in, say, at Tech, back in the, the, the 30s, when did you sort of your, you and your friends realize there's probably going to be a war, a big war? You know, you, you were in tech in the late 30s, right? Early 40s? Well, actually, I, I graduated in uh, uh, 43. Uh, 43. 43, okay. okay. So let's go back to, say, 1939 and 40. Before the war started, but there was a lot going on in Europe. Did did you have any idea that there was going to be something as big as World War II back then? Well, I, well, you know, it, we we joined the tech. I was ROTC. Right. Well, that world, and uh, you, you during the summer you went to summer camp, etc. So you use it once you finish. You would be actually go into automatically into the service. So. Uh, there was not any question or that I signed up right. in the service. I, I went into actually equipment first and, and uh, they give you a, give you a corporal assignment. Then I went into officer candidate school. Mm. So there was any question 
about my brother's service. I wasn't, mm. I wasn't driving right. per se when you were put in the service. But so. did it, before World War II started, did you have a pretty good idea that there was going to be a big war? Well, not really. I wasn't per se that involved with it. But, it yeah. was, uh, but uh, of course, it was a, uh, a major war. You know? um, do you remember where you were when Pearl Harbor was attacked? And Actually, you? yeah, I, we were sitting in my in my father's house, and uh, and President Roosevelt came on, me, and uh, and when he you know he made his message, yeah. you know that for all the, I don't remember exactly what he said, but right. you remember of course he he made a message that when Pearl Harbor. So, uh, what was the reaction of your family and your friends? Well, they just seemed to you know, well, you know, one thing about. Pearl Harbor, I don't think you realize it, that whether the Japanese were flying over to attack Pearl Harbor, there was a young officer who was at a, a preliminary uh, program where you could pick up uh, information of uh, <coughs> items coming in, and he, he picked up the, the something was coming in to Pearl Harbor, and the major Officer says, "Ah, oh, baloney." Well, actually, that was the Germans and the, the Japanese. And those, if they had listened to the soldiers, the officer there, they could have started prepared and put ships on down. So that was really a major fiasco. Yeah. And, and actually, with the, with the Germans and attacking with a major attack, that was a fiasco. Actually, we were not prepared for it. There were. Uh, and I read on it's Malmody. In Malmody, there, there was some uh, artillery unit that was in the back there. And uh, the Germans came right on through, and they actually got everybody together, and the Germans took everything out of their pockets, etc. The next they came in, the SS troops. The SSS troops, like you sometimes see in the movie, they had the machine gun in the back of a truck, and they they actually murdered almost 90 percent of the, a few of the soldiers were able to survive us, act like they were dead or something. You know, there's no way of other people doing there's nothing to stop the Germans because uh, we, our, our officers, some way or other, our major forces did not realize that this was a major assault by the Germans, yeah. not just with fighting. And, uh, was that referred to as the Malmody Massacre? Yeah, yeah it was yeah. Malmody Massacre. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, they, had, they left the bodies there so that you go ahead and uh, get out the water. If the Germans uh, actually happened to be, I don't know, you know the, the German officers who actually did that, which they who did that. They would be, be charged as for murder. Oh yeah, yeah. and so, so right a little stories of, of the two people who survived. Yeah. So they were laid back, and it just came right, and the Germans right all through. Okay. But uh, let so, me ask you this: when you, when you first got to Europe, where did you land? Where where was your first stop? And uh, actually. We were on his, came on his ship, you know, yeah. and uh, we landed in Burma. Okay. Burma. In, uh, in Germany, we landed at the harbor, and then we just moved on, uh, on across France. Okay, and so uh, you, you landed in France yeah, and yeah, went across yeah, France. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And by the we had we have a half track. With, yeah. And I, I was in a Jeep. Okay. And so, so uh, in reality, it, it missions. Uh, when Goof, you know, when the Germans broke through, the only thing that saved us, it was a freezing weather, snow and uh, foggy, and the weather had cleared up. And thank heaven for that. Our Allied Air Force was able to catch the Germans on the road. And the war was over in three or four months after that. And what you're describing is the Battle of the Bulge, right? Well, the Battle of the Bulge. That part, but, but uh, this was after the Battle of the Bulge. You're uh, talking about after it now. Okay. The, the, uh, uh, the weather cleared up. Yeah. And, uh, and the uh, Allied forces get their planes right. 
the Germans are on the road and they get foul foul of food. So they yeah. so therefore they, they uh that it was still through but it's a very severe war. Yeah. But there was a but by that time I had left my unit and I was with uh, in the hospital and uh, yeah. and then came back and decided to uh service uh unit. Is there anything else you want to talk about as far as while you were in combat in Europe? Any anything you want to say about that as far as uh, experience? Well, actually, in a mission, uh, I was as an article by and I was the uh, West Point Society of Atlanta, the lady who does a very work for it. She wrote a beautiful article. We got a copy of it over here, and uh, told about there was uh, uh, how we got where we were at, and stuff, uh, and, yeah, okay. and how we were wounded, and stuff. And, uh, and so, so she, so that told quite a bit about us. And one fact I want to get on here is, what was your responsibility while you were in? Europe, while you were working your way across Europe, what was your position and what was your responsibility? I was a troop leader, okay. and we have a 27 millimeter anti tank gun, okay. and uh, we never fired it. So, you know, uh, our only contact that I was with was when, we, when the Germans shelled us. You know, okay. uh, we really did something that had to had combat, right. fortunately. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm not complaining about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, you see the movies, The Band of the Brothers and stuff, yeah. and all that. So, Where were you when the war officially was over? I was, over, I, I was with the Stravis News Company. Okay. Uh, so I was outside of the actual combat unit. So. Yeah. Did you have any Concern that if the war continued in in Japan or in the Far East, that you would be going over there. Well, our unit was got actually in an assignment. I was up in a in a military unit assignment. So, but there were actually plans that that's what it would be that actually the soldiers were being will be moving into Japan. Yeah, and then, and then with. Uh, Tremendous uh, loss of life mm -hmm. and uh, attack in Japan. Then we, we had the uh, atomic bomb yeah. solve that. So yeah. that's the only thing nobody, what anybody thought about, at least the Germans, the, the Japanese, after Hiroshima, Nagasaki, uh, the war was over. Right. So, uh, and no matter what you thought about it, and the power. It destroyed the city and people died, but it did. Have been millions of American soldiers would have been lost. Yeah. Uh, attacking Japan because that's what the next step was. So we actually yeah. moved it into Japan. While we were talking earlier, before we got on camera, you talked about how people were selected to go back home after the war. The well, numbers. Yes, have, have, that's the suburb of the suburb mm -hmm. That's why. Yeah, but Jeff said, okay. I can't remember how many service hours, but when I get that could be, when I get the service hours, and they, they told me, I said, well, so if, if you stay in the unit, we'll move you up to captain, that's the well, it's time for me to go back home. So, yeah. uh, so, so we moved back slowly, a little by little back here, here, and then finally uh, came on back home. What was the trip like going back, knowing that you were no longer in a war? As you well, were... I it did, per se, bother me a lot. I was glad that I, was, that I had survived, you know, and that I was going home. And as uh, we talked about a very interesting story with Bertie, and there was actually a shotgun wedding. I never asked her <laughs> to marry me. She came back from, she came from California to Atlanta, and after two days, they had already engaged us. In other words, said, I was cheesed over that. <laughs> and uh, so, that amazingly remarkable that I had not seen her since one time 
But when I was going to New York, I stopped off and watched the scene. I saw her. I thought we wrote correspond with each other. And uh, when she came from California to Atlanta for this uh, part of the veterans, then there was uh, the her uncles and aunts here and her parents in California. We got together and they had a engagement party, had all these people there. In other words, and uh, my, my poor innocent and me, I was uh, I just got, she just got in. I haven't seen her for two days. And uh, so uh, I teased her, hey, you know, I never asked her to marry me. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I never said, said, said no. <laughs> but uh, How long have you been married now? Uh, 72 years. Boy, what a love story. Yeah. We have, we have a remarkable family, remarkable kids. Uh, we, I'm, I'm from the old school. There was a, I'm not friends with my kids. I have a father and all the children, <laughs> and therefore there was, and what we said, this is what you do. And, yeah. was, and, uh, and I never have any problem with that. And I would say that it's helped the kids because they seem to carry on. They, has, they did well, actually. Uh, actual relationship, I have, I have one or two relationships we had a lot, but uh, it's a great family. It's good, yeah. The, uh, well, they followed your example. Yeah. Well, they they they, they say that and there was a set the example there. That's true. It's, uh, I want to go back again to say when you were in college or high school. Atlanta's a very big city now. Yeah. Talk a little bit about what Atlanta was like back then. Well, actually, we lived on Price Street, and we lived uh, uh, two blocks from George Avenue School, where we went to school, mm -hmm. and then two blocks from Walmart School, and then we went to Hope Smith. Uh, the, uh, uh, my father left my mother 50 cents a day to uh, mm -hmm. food for feed us and there was that's a tight it was and uh, so but the, uh, they were close families and, um, and and actually the majority of the of my family fam, family families were all lived in that area there Prosperity okay. okay if you don't think about Prosperity I do I did George mm -hmm. Avenue mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so uh, it was a small town back then, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, it was a small town. And, uh, actually, they've even had a that show where just most of the people that we knew, they came from the Isle of Rose, and uh, a very interesting story there. And they lived in, uh, actually, four or five streets, 90% of all the people who came from Rose, actually, came to that area there, and that's where they did that. They used to get together on Sundays and, and they play the uh, games, etc., etc. Yeah. So it's, uh, Gosh. And, uh, it's remarkable that, you know, that we were poor, but we didn't know it, so. Yeah. Know, yeah. But, uh, Is there anything else you'd like to say about your business career or what you did after the military? I know you talked about who you worked for and what you did. Is there anything else you want to? Well, the fortunate part that I had was that uh, when I went to work for Raylock, Division of Changing Parts, uh, that uh, I thought I was there for a few years to get a good program, and, uh, 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 and they would actually give you uh, extra payments at the end of the year, and there was a, and, uh, and uh, since I had a seven kids, and, and uh, we were actually supporting the kids, I mean, like we told my daughter when she was in uh, med school, in other words, the tuition, uh, not as much as it is now, but there was a, it was still a tuition, and we paid all the medical schools. You know. In other words, mm -hmm. so that we didn't burden them, but my grandson, who went to every law school, you know, he had a heavy, still paying on his student loans. So 
my kids didn't have to worry about student loans. Mm -hmm. So I, I, mm -hmm. I thought that was really important because I, I know most of my daughter was in Maryland. Her husband actually had a very heavy student loans, and yeah. uh, so it's a. Uh, but we, it's a very warm family. Uh, when I have a balance problem, and uh, really, unfortunately, I fell it, and uh, a few days ago, and the family all start calling in to get in mm -hmm. touch. I had uh, Deborah, who's uh, the infectious disease doctor. She's an eye doctor. We call her anti medical race. We don't. We have a medical doctor that we go mm -hmm. to, but she's what we call to. And get in touch, and they went in touch with uh, everybody all the way across the board with each other. Mm -hmm. So it's a, and I told them that uh, they're not the normal family. They love each other, get together. Mm -hmm. I know so many families where they, their relationship is not a very warm relationship. But with my kids, they're just super. So I'm uh, real proud of them. And uh, yes, to know that I say, but. We made a difference in the way we raise our kids too. Yeah. And, uh, but um, well, they're fortunate to have yeah. a father like you. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so we're we're delighted, you know, and I'm, I'm delighted. That, you know, I'm going. I'll be 98 next month. In other words, whatever reason or whatever we're doing, I don't know. I stay busy. I I was president of the Calgary Jurors Association. And just this past month or two, uh, after 27 years as president, I said it's time for me to yeah. come vote out. Yeah. I'm president of my civic club. I've got 80 email addresses of all my civic club at all your five streets here. Gosh. And I keep in touch. And uh, my cousin and my grandma, she got the booklet which told our family to the odd family. And uh, so we got in touch with people that we have not met, pressed them before, but who are part of our Delayed family, and so we came to just this past week. One of my cousins' family was in Paris, and they wanted to visit one of my cousins, and the email was not working. But I, I had an email, and I sent an email to her, and they, and they sent me a picture they met with a young man Gosh. who we know from there in Paris. Yeah, wow. so, so. Oh, have you ever gone back to Europe where you served? No, I'm busy raising seven kids. I really. <laughs> Yeah, I, that's I true. Never, I, I didn't go, and Miss B didn't say to go anywhere like that anyhow. So yeah. well, the only time that we finally got a chance to go around was when uh, I was finished working, in other words, and so and I, I was working seven day a week, guy, and uh, so we had a chance to go and visit our family and, and, get, yeah. and go to the kids getting married, etc. So, yeah. you know, Sue, do you have any questions or anything you want to um, Just one. You mentioned when you were wounded in Bastogne that you had shell shock. Yeah. Did your experiences in the war cause you difficulty after you came home? That's some post-traumatic stress disorder. Some, I can't figure out what it was. I, I never had heard about it before. I don't, uh, so why does it seem to bother me so much what I'm doing here and there? And it didn't seem to associate that. Hey, that was a, 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 it's not the severe post-traumatic stress disorder like some of the soldiers have that uh, uh, create a major problem. But I didn't know what, what it was, but I said, these things bother me. Why should this just bother me here? And, uh, and, uh, and it dawned on me that, you know, was it, until I started reading about it. Yeah. So yes, it's, uh, we have that. Yeah. Mm. But I, I didn't have the major problems I have. And uh, we, uh, fortunately, we still, had, you know, in 1978, going down to Alzheimer's and such. A, fortunately, yeah. you know, we just blessed it. You know, and, uh, we have not been uh, having that problems as that. So, uh, I mean, what you, my wife Mary is watch over me like a hawk. Because you know, you know, um, I have a balance problem. Uh, and I had this one, but the worst part about it, I fell on my hip, so I mm. all my the others on my head, so my head was hard enough to this involved me. The one on my hip really gave me so, uh, uh, 
we would wait for a physical therapist to come and work with us on, on that problem there. But she's been very close and warm with us. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah, well, actually, my family I came from uh, out of Rose. And in 1944, the Italians were there, and so there was a relationship of all my family, there were about 1,500 people, at least uh, of club people there. And uh, when the Italians gave up the war, the Germans came into uh, Rose, and it was, I guess, possibly. Uh, where it was located at, the Germans before it takes place over. And then in 1944, they rounded up all the people, including uh, these uh, grandparents and uncles and aunts, which were actually rounded up with all the rest of them, and they ended up in Auschwitz, and most of them died in uh -huh. Auschwitz. And then, so, most of my, my, my family had already moved out, and so thank heaven for that. So it's, uh, hmm. it was really a shame to wipe out a a population that's been there for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. So yes. that was really terrible. To, the Germans came in and rounded up the people there and, and put them in the uh, trains, cabs, and uh, yeah. some of them even died on the on the on the, on the trains there. Yeah. And uh, that people were that cruel. It's just a uh, the Holocaust and such a, that people were actually had people dig trenches and then fire away and drop their bodies in the trenches and such a, and what kind of people were they who do that? So, so. That must have been hard for you with your faith serving in yeah. Germany and did you ever worry about being captured? Or? We didn't know that actually. Well actually what we had, that's another story. Actually, um, when the Germans told us that um, they would not surrender, uh, that we would been taken prisoners, and, uh, and as I was a Jewish faith, we would have been actually assigned to another area and didn't live very well. And the story goes on there that there were over a thousand American soldiers in the Stalag, and uh, the Germans came up, and uh, the master sergeant of the American forces who was there, and he said, "All the soldiers here who are of Jewish faith, y'all step out out." And the sergeant says, "We're all Jewish people." And the German officer puts the gun to his head, and he says, "Go ahead, if you shoot." When the war is over, you'll be tried to turn for uh, killing American soldiers like that. So he was uh, he was recognized for people who did a lot of that they did. Mm -hmm. and actually, that he had the guts to tell them, right, shoot. So, and and very likely where the unit was at, we would have been the in that prison. Really. What happened actually when the the attack of the Germans was such that uh, the 106th Infantry uh, Division was brought up into the front line and it was, it was just freezing weather and nothing was going to be happening in the freezing weather. And the Germans came in and what they did, the Germans, so you couldn't hear the tanks, they had trucks push the tanks over and uh, they captured almost over half of the 106 Division soldiers there. I knew one person who was uh, actually taken prisoner mm. of that. So that's how divisive it was. That the Americans did not know, you know, that the Germans were planning this uh, mm. uh, attack there. And that really uh, is a major failure because it's, they should have, some way, have known what was happening, some way or the other. Just because actually this artillery unit uh, uh, weapons actually, uh, field artillery, who was actually murdered, there was a, uh, they would have been alerted. So they, 
The drugs that came right on in. I want to follow up on something Sue asked you. Did you see any camps, any of the uh, concentration camps? And part of no, the no. I didn't get my actually after I left my unit, the work my tenth Army division did actually contact the camp. Okay. I remember seeing the article yeah. that told that they stopped the camp and had oh, that actually, yeah. you know, oh. and, and when they, they actually they made sure that people knew what happened. Yeah. And how terrible it was there. So you don't believe it yeah. happened when it did yeah. happen. So yeah. and uh, well, don't you think it's so good that people are still talking about it to yeah. be sure that the yeah. next generations know about it? Yeah. You really, I mean, you, you wonder what in the world would allow people to uh, allow that to happen to the. It's. To, to rebel against that type of a Holocaust, killing people. I know. It's, and, uh, you it's know, just, the story of a mother with a child and, and the. Taken into the concentration camp, and uh, the mother takes the child. And she she goes into the camp and died. Rather, she she went gave her an opportunity to not go into the yeah. Holocaust. So it's, uh, yeah, it's just horrible. And, uh, it is. It is. It's. it's uh, I mean, it's indescribable. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, I want to give you a chance to say anything else you want to say before we f finish, and we'll get some of your pictures and some of the other things to show. But is there anything else that you would like to say, either a message to people who are watching this, or anything you want to say that you didn't say? Or well, we all? talked before about it was actually uh, where the soldiers who came back. We're not talking about what happened, yeah. and, uh, and and so when they had the obituary, they told about he had this and this and he got this some water there, and the children didn't know about it. I I made sure that my family knew everything they did. I always kept in touch with them. I keep in touch with them, right. and uh, so uh, it's not something that all of a sudden they hear that I got a purple heart and a bronze star yeah. and such and that. And the other thing, it was in the hospital or something. So uh, it was that uh, it wasn't something that we would be talking about, but some people were affected differently, I guess. In other words. And, uh, but while they went, let the family know, it would help them because actually, with my post traumatic stress disorder, and yeah. the stress that the soldiers went through, and uh, uh, and for some reason or another, the sub soldiers just would not talk about the war. Now, some of them so, I guess, uh, it was such horrible things to them that they just couldn't talk about it. Yeah. But uh, they really, it would have been best for them to talk about it to get it out of the system. Yes. Yeah. Well, I agree with you, and I'm glad you did that yeah, yeah. and are doing it still. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I always make sure that they get a full. So everything I did, and everything I do now, you know, as a family, the parents would go to the doctor, what the doctor said, and I'd tell them everything, what the story is. I've got, I have post-traumatic stress disorder. That's a, yeah. actually where it affects your eyesight. I have to use a magnifying glass. Uh, oh. Some people actually use a sight. You know, and and I, I had, <laughs> uh, I had a heartbeat that seemed to be just right at the VA, and so we went there to take a story and, and checked it and said, you have a leaking uh, heart valve, but it's not something critical, so it's okay. And uh, so I have a, well, I went to, I had my fall, went to Embry and they checked, so you don't have any breaking bones, they have, but ended up, I did have a minor, Fracture, and other words, it'll heal. So, and, and the family does this, which I asked my daughters, told everybody, it's, it's a matter of fracture, and it's a uh, uh, therapy will help take care of that. So, so I think that's important that uh, 
the soldiers tell this story. Yeah, yes. And it talks about it. Because, well, actually, if you, if you keep something in, it eats you up. So it's best to go ahead and bring it all out and let everybody know what to talk about it. So. Well, following up on that, I want to be sure that you get a chance to describe the jacket you're wearing. Mm -hmm. When you got that and how long you've had it? I mean, it's obviously your, the un, part of your uniform that you had. Yeah, well, actually, this is a 75 year old. Everybody, hardly anybody 75 years later can put a, a jacket on it would fit. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I, I, I waited a little less time, so, <laughs> <laughs> so that's always remarkable to say hi to the world. He still put on a, a uniform. Like, I cleaned it up and put it on. It looks great. Yeah. That's, yeah. And would you just point out to the camera your purple heart and also tell us what the the ribbon, the medal on your the left side oh. of your coat is? So, well, actually, with purple heart, when I, uh, when I took my, back to the hospital and they gave me the beer, I just, something you get a purple heart. And when I actually ended up being shell shocked and left my unit, that paperwork got lost. And so it took me uh, many years to contact uh, our representatives of Washington State, et cetera, to finally get the award okay. presented to me. So I got my purple heart afterwards. Okay. In other words, uh, I have a copy of that. Right. Oh, I get the purple heart. Yeah. And would you describe the the medal on your the left side of your yeah, jacket? That's the the, uh, the French government had set up that they they would uh, uh, present the award to people who fought for it, who had who were in France and other words, and who saved us in other words, uh, that you know, American forces came into Germany. You know, the French, if you remember, with the when the Germans came through mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the British soldiers were actually rescued from that. There's a movie about that that was about, mm -hmm. about the uh, British forces, uh, yeah. everybody, all the small sh boats, ships yeah. came through to rescue the, yeah. the, the soldiers and carry them back to England. Yeah. Uh, and you've got uh, what appear to be first lieutenant bars. On Actually, but what, when you're in service, uh, if you serve for one year, you became a back to first lieutenant. Okay. So and we, we read that and said that, so we applied. Okay. Got this first lieutenant. So when you left the Army, you were first lieutenant, right? I first lieutenant. Okay. If I stayed, they would allow me to become a captain, yeah. but I said, no, time, yeah. time to hold them. I said, yeah. so, uh, well, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you doing this, um, and just sitting here and hearing your story is a wonderful experience for Sue and for me. And I mean, you grew up without a lot of money. Your family was not rich, but you studied hard. You went to college. You graduated, and then your military service speaks for itself. And. What's even as impressive is what you've done since then with young people, yeah. these Eagle Scouts wow. and the, the people that you've influenced in your life. And just talking about your family, I mean, I can't imagine uh, two parents that have been as influential on their children oh, yeah. or grandchildren as, as you and Bertie have. Yeah, that's remarkable. And I'm, I'm delighted with what, what you all are doing, and I really appreciate you all. I know it's a lot of a lot better is at least to come up and, hey, start talking, you know, <laughs> yeah. hey, uh, let your family know what, what you went through. Yeah. And, uh, and, they, and we know that, you know, it's created a problem for you, but think if you keep it for yourself, you want to tear yourself up. You need to be open on it and talk about it. And it yes. helps to help you, you know, as you, you get over that. So, yeah. and uh, we are... I really don't know as to why I, I stay to good health. I just stay busy. I'm, I'm, I'm in everything. Uh, uh, I'm seven day a week. I was working yeah. on something. That I was uh, 
That's that right. may be a big reason why you're so healthy. Yeah. And a good mental attitude, too. You, yeah. You've got a sense of humor. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, before we finish, I, I, I want to read some quotes about you that is in this Robert Ross Johnson Humanitarian oh. Award oh. program. And these are quotes that I think need to be preserved on here from former scouts. Uh, the first one is, he taught us respect, honor, and discipline. The importance of relationships. Another Eagle Scout says, he walks the earth with grace. He gave each of us the tools to be a better person. I mean, I can't imagine anything that could be said more complimentary to somebody than what these young men said. So. Well, it's actually, that's what I'm saying. Why, after 70 years, I'm still working with boys. Well. And uh, fortunate that I'm still healthy. If I yeah. be careful of my. <laughs> something about a balance problem is that it gets foul. You don't know why or what happens. And uh, so, and finally this time, it, it was the first time it fell on my hip, and that's because of more problem. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, we, we're thankful for a wonderful family we have. We're thankful for y'all and know as uh, come in and get people, hey, talk about your history, yeah. and bring it out, and let your family know what's happening. Uh, and uh, so. You want to show stuff here or cut it? Let's cut because okay. I don't have to move. So. Well, it, it's been a real honor for me and for Sue to just meet you, number one, but to be able to hear your life story has been an incredible experience for both of us. And I can't tell you how impressed I am with the kind of person you are. And, and I want to thank you for your service. Well, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank well, I you. All the articles I have over here will go for on for uh, months and read all the articles to have it. In other words, uh, the, the West Point Society, the lady wrote the article, I have a copy of it here. It's, uh, she wrote a beautiful article about it. And I was amazed, I didn't give her the information. She got the information out of herself. Well, and so, well, I mean, what these Eagle Scouts said about you yeah. had to make has to make you feel yeah. good. Oh yes. I mean that's amazing. Well, yeah. thank you. We thank you for letting us come today. Thank yeah. You so much. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we're delighted that we're able to live long enough to be able to well watch the boys grow up. Yeah. And and come back to tell you how much John has been to them. Yeah. And. Uh, Oh, and it, we still have our facilities, uh, and uh, yeah, you're incredible. I mean, you, yeah. <laughs> you're. We, inter we we do a lot of these interviews. You're amazing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that is, that is true. I don't know. I, you said your your balance is bad. You probably got better balance than either one of us too. <laughs> yeah. You look like you're walking pretty good. Yeah. Well, well thank you. All right, I'm gonna. We're going to 